Hi everyone, welcome to Studio Sunday. Hey, did everyone see Richard Branson go into space yeah. and then come back down? Amazing. Very cool. Yes. I would do it in a heartbeat, would you? Uh, no, I'll be waiting on the ground with some snacks for you. <laughs> I'll have lunch ready. I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> yes, you would. You're, she's a daredevil. So cool. Yeah. Anyway, onward. Well, you know, you kind of had tested for it already because we did the cent uh, centrifuge at Disney World and it's 3G and you were great. you happy as a lark. Yeah. Yeah. I crawled out of there on my knees. <laughs> Sorry, babe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Serial 5 came out on Wednesday. Uh, so you guys be sure to pick it up at your local comic shop or on our website. It's up on the site. Go get it. And if you've missed any issues, the first trade, the glass tomb, has shipped from the printer, which doesn't mean much these days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exactly sure when we're going to receive it. It is so crazy out there right now trying to get things to and from. What used to take four or five days is taking two, three weeks. So um, anyway, we're hoping to get it here in the next few days. Let's say that. <laughs> things have changed out there in the world, so it's hard to navigate it. And Terry will let you know on social media when we get them in the store. So, um, and then they'll be in comic shops. I think it's the 28th. So hopefully we'll get them before then. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, an update on the 2021 sketchbook hardcover. We are reprinting it with our tried and true printer here in uh, Texas Brenner Printing in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. They print all of our um, individual issues. So we trust them completely yeah. to do a good job. And Terry, you're actually going to go over to San Antonio, aren't you? Yeah. And do a press check. Do a press check, put my eyes on it, uh, make sure it's um, what you what you paid for. So, and I think we'll see those in about three weeks. Maybe three yeah. to four weeks. Yeah. Anyway, as a bonus, no customs to deal with, so we should get it very quickly. It's a 200-mile drive. Mm -hmm. We could actually go pick them up if we yeah, needed to. Yeah, go get them. Yeah. I have to make a bunch of trips. I can only carry one box at a time, but, uh, you know. <laughs> so I want to talk about conventions for a second. We've had a lot of questions about if Terry's going to be making any appearances this year, and the answer to that is just very simple. The answer is no. No shows this year at all. Uh, we know there are lots of shows that are happening in the second half of the year, but we have decided to wait until next year to get back out there. Um, Terry's got a lot on his plate right now, and things are still, you know, kind of in flux, so we just made the decision to wait until next year. Right now, um, you're just scheduled for San Diego Comic-Con next year in July, okay. uh, but I'm sure, you know, the schedule will change as things change. Okay. But nothing in 2021. So if you want to catch Terry live, you have to come to Terry Moore Live on October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Mm -hmm. We'll be live streaming and I'm um, going to have a lot of sketches. We're going to have original art for sale. Um, books will be on sale. Yep. Major things going on. Um, Maybe even a band. We'll have a parade. <laughs> Stop me when I get out of control. <laughs> You're already out of control. <laughs> And speaking of San Diego Comic-Con, they're doing San Diego Comic-Con at home again this year. Mm -hmm. And it's July 23rd through the 25th. You will be doing a panel, but it is pre-recorded. It's yeah. not live. I've already pre-recorded that panel. And you'll let them know as soon as you have a date and time on that? Yes. I okay. Um, we're also going to be an exhibitor, quote, at that show. And you can go to our exhibitor site and there are 10 items up there that are, will be for sale. Mm. It's just our books. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to buy it during the Comic-Con at home sale, mm -hmm. uh, you can make a note in your order and you'll sign the books for them, won't you? Yes, I will. Uh, just like we were at a show. You buy it, I'll sign it. Yeah. Um, that's great. And I, I'm sure that, you know, we have a, a, a core group that... Uh, has access to all this but the you know the thing about San Diego Comic-Con is all the people that maybe you've never met before uh, it's a big gathering of people from around the world and uh, it's our chance to show our books to the world yeah so um, so keep that in mind it's July 23rd 24th and 25th okay. but next year we'll be there 
It'll be a thousand degrees in Houston in July, and we'll get off that plane in San Diego. It'll be a balmy seventy degrees. Yeah, <laughs> heaven on earth. So. Yeah, and we we were so happy to go to San Diego every year because of the weather change. Yeah, so much cooler. Yeah, so we're looking forward to that next year. So everybody, uh, keep that in mind. Um, so, Mr. Moore, mm. how's the sketching coming? Oh boy, I think I got two sketches made this week. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay, and just saying there are 92 late days left until October 1st. 92 days. I have 10 sketches done. <laughs> so <laughs> I need to do a sketch a day. Yeah, pretty much. And it needs, it better be a masterpiece. It better be. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, heads will roll. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be an interesting three months, folks. Who came up with this 100 idea? You did. No, I yeah. surely not. Was I drinking? <laughs> I think you must have been. <laughs> yeah, I'll I will 100. say the, uh, the nagging, I mean encouraging, <laughs> has been paying off because the book's getting a little thicker every day. Well, it is. It is. I, I, we should actually just record it like Alexis, and I'll just hit a button. Alexa. Alexa, how are you doing on your sketches? How are you doing on your sketches? <laughs> so I'm just saying you've got 92 days to come up with the sketches. Oh, joy. So. Well, it's plenty of time. No problem. Good, Absolutely. Good. We got uh, this covered. I'll check in with you next week. Oh, we got this covered. As will everybody watching this. Mm. So, just so you know. Okay, now that that's over, are you ready to get on the hot seat? Yeah, of course. I'm not afraid. <laughs> Bring it. Okay, the first question is regarding equipment. Mm. Do you think you can get the same high quality of work with personal equipment as opposed to professional equipment, i.e. light boxes, scanners, etc.? Do you need a professional scanner or can you get the same quality with just a scanner that's like on your printer? Um, that is a technical question. What you want, depends on where you want your art to go. If you want it to go to the web, and you know, you're running, everything you're doing is off of um, the internet, that's where you're showing your art, then you only need something that can achieve, say like 300 DPI, which I think these multi uh, printer scanner devices can do. So you're fine with that. Really the whole thing about the bigger scanners is to get much higher DPI so that you can uh, get a higher resolution for print. Um, so my scanner goes up to, I think, 1600 or 1800 DPI. Um, and that's because I want to way over qualify the scan for the printer. So that every little line is okay. That's not the case for the web. The web, whatever you do is gonna, you're gonna pull it down to 72 DPI and put it up on the internet. So I think, you know, you don't need a $2,000 scanner to get images on the internet. But if you're planning to print them, you need a better scanner. If you're planning to print, you need to scan at high resolution. And um, I'm sure it's much more affordable now than it ever was. What about things like light boxes and that type of thing? I have two light boxes. One of them is a big old clunky, clunky wooden thing. And I use it to uh, mark off my 11 by 17 art. But when I'm just doing sketches, um, as you've seen, it's not right here, but you've seen it before, I use a $50 plastic uh, light box, a little flat thing, it looks like a notebook. And um, I saw it because of Jeff Scott Campbell was using it one time in a video. Um, and it just lays right on your table, plug it in real quick, um, very easy. And, and if you're working in this format. But it's more nine by 12. Size. Yeah. Or eight and a half by 11. It's just slightly bigger than the eight and a half by 11. So it's very useful actually, uh, you know, to get these big light boxes is a pain. You have to have a table for them or something. So yeah, $50 light box is all I use for sketches and things like that. You saw me do that last week when I was repositioning drawings and getting them just right. So instead of having to redraw something over and over, I draw this, draw that, put them on the light box, get them perfect, and then uh, make it the one drawing over that. Very helpful. So you don't necessarily need the most professional, most expensive 
high quality stuff to make good art. Right, you don't. Well, look at Frank Cho has the ballpoint pen drawings. So he's using a big pen. He's using a big pen. It's, you know, it's, uh, I think it's 50 cents or now. And um, for the sketch that I did today and last week, I was using a cheap Ticonderoga school pencil. Um, you know, it's, you don't, you can, and you can go out and spend $5,000 on a pencil. Go to Mont, go get a Mont Blanc if you want, but it doesn't make you, your drawing better. Okay. Mm. Um, you ready for question number two? Yes. Can you talk a little about your process for beginning a page? Do you do thumbnails in advance or just begin drawing? Do you draw to your writing or do you write for the drawing? Boy, that second question is, people ask that a lot. Um, first off, I, I only use thumbnails if I'm concerned about the sequence, uh, but if it's, typically I don't. If I have something tricky to work out, I'll use thumbnails to work it out. But if I'm just laying out the story, um, it's still in my head and my page is my big thumbnail. Um, I've noticed that if you have, if you're working off of a tight script from a writer or you wrote a tight script, then thumbnails are a good idea because there will be this description in the script of here are the five panels and what needs to be happening. And then you are seeing this for the first time, you want to figure out how you're going to work those five panels and fit them in uh, like dominoes and our puzzle. But for me as a writer, artist, uh, cartoonist, um, when it's time for me to draw the next page, um, I'm comfortable with just starting with the blank white, start at the top left, and I, as I'm making that first panel, I'm thinking about its relationship to the other four or the other five. How big do I want that moment? And it's really about uh, how big is the moment on the page. You have five moments on the page. Which one is the most important? That's who gets the most real estate. And then the others are either linking key scenes together or uh, they're just uh, a cutaway shot for a quick reference, or it's a setting shot, like sometimes in the middle, I'll put the landscape shot just so you can get a sense of place, things like that. So this is all kind of going in your head and you're, you're doing it live, you're making decisions as you work. Um, and that's kind of the cartooning way. Cartoonists don't tend to write out tight, tight scripts, they tend to just dive in let their mind take over. Well, but if it's a group effort, if there's a writer, a penciler, an inker, a colorist, then you have to be tight. You have to follow the script. Um, if you're working with somebody who demands respect, somebody with a lot of uh, work under their belt, you follow that script. Um, so if they have eight scenes on a page and they may even say, this is the key scene, this is the big scene, then you can do smaller panels. Some people are very descriptive like that. Some people leave it to you. Um, and then it, re it depends on how good the artist is as to whether they got a sequence that was visually pleasing and also did exactly, told the story the writer wanted to tell. So you ha you're wearing uh, the hat of responsibility to be truthful to the story, to the writer, uh, to, the, to the message the writer's trying to send, uh, send in those uh, visuals. At, so at what point do you decide, I'm going to do a splash page? Uh, again, the, if you're working with a writer, the script will tell you. Go for it. Draw I'm the, talking about you. Me? Um, this is I, all about you. No, it's not. You told me time <laughs> and time again it's not about me. Oh, I'm not falling for that trap. Uh, you do a splash page when this is the big moment, jaw-dropping moment. This is the thing that... The previous pages all led up to this moment. Say, for instance, uh, Francine walks in on Freddie cheating on her. That's a splash page. Do you want to bury that in a little panel at the bottom of the page, or do you want to have the big moment, Freddie's most embarrassing moment ever? You want that as big as possible. <laughs> okay. So, because you don't do many splash pages. No, I don't. I'm more of a storyteller. I think more in terms of. Um, um, you know, it's, I'm just telling a story. I'm really involved in that. For a splash page, it would have to be either some beautiful scene, uh, an establishing shot, or this key moment between people. 
that is really major. And those are my requirements. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know what, you, you know what you'd never find me doing is a splash page of New York City. <laughs> yeah, which uh, all those people that draw the superhero comics can draw the cities with all the buildings and all that. Wow. Mm -mm. Not, not your. Not happening. Not your. No, no buildings. Thing to do. I try not to draw a lot of buildings. Okay, well that's it for me. What are you drawing today? Today, uh, speaking of not drawing buildings, uh, I'm going to draw a sketch with Rachel uh, standing in a lake with uh, the, the horizon behind her and the sun rising. And the reason I wanted to draw something like that was to show the effects that you can get with a simple pencil, how to do standing water, moving water, uh, the, what it looks like, uh, and also how to do the trees with the sun behind them on, when it's 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, what effects can you do? If you try to do it all with the point of your pencil, it's gonna look like an etching. So you get into more pencil effects. And I thought that might be something worth talking about is pencil effects uh, in the open air. Okay. That's what, so. Okay, meet up here and I, I will see you guys next week. Okay, meet me right here. Okay, so what I wanted to do was draw a scene where Rachel is in a lake and it's dawn. So there's the sun coming up behind her. And uh, first off, I'm just trying to get Rachel in position. But this really isn't about drawing Rachel or drawing a figure. I'm just uh, trying to get her there in a setting. Um, for the drawing itself, I'll just use my uh, pencil point and do what you've seen me do before, which is measure out and figure out my um, relationships between the head to the shoulders and all that. Now that I have the head kind of sort of drawn and in proportion, I work on, uh, I'll look at the shoulder width and right now I'm trying to make sure that the hair looks thick and not stringy. Uh, the way you achieve that is to make sure you don't have a lot of lines down there. Um, and I'm going to put her in an old-fashioned um, undergarment, you know, like um, just the white, long white slip, sleeveless, like you would have found underneath Victorian clothing. Um, I don't know why I'm doing that. It's just she draws from so many years of uh, fashion styles. Um, so sure, she should have a 100-year-old undergarment in her closet. Because she was there then, right? She lives a long time. I have an interesting point here to point out. Um, I'm about to add the buttons on this drawing there. If you put them on the right, that's where the buttons are for men. The buttons for women's garments are on the left. And I don't know if guys, all guys know that. So it's a little detail that you can put into your drawing that shows that you pay a little bit of attention in life. Um, okay, what I want to do with this background, once I get her in position, is try to use the side of the pencil to get some effects for the water. Um, at this point, I'm thinking about where is she in relation to the water? Is the water moving around her? Um, you know, she disappears underneath the water line, but the water is reacting to the body that's down there. And that's what all those ripples are all about. So put in the horizon line and a low, um, a low uh, horizon there. No Himalayas for us. This will be like in a, a field with a lake. So I'm doing the trees here, um, and I'm just kind of marking out where they will be right now. Um, it's a matter of what I really wanted was tall trees, mature, that the limbs don't start until you're way up there, so that we can see through the trunks of the trees. Um, I didn't want a lot of, you know, there's no bushes or anything like that blocking the view of the sky 
I kind of have this vision in mind. Um, that simple drawing of the trees in the snow um, is just something I've always liked. It's this very simple drawing, but um, it puts me in place. So I'm, I'm kind of pointing out there that um, the surface of the water is something that I'm going to deal with last. So I'm diving into the trees and trying to get a little bit of um, volume going there. And one of the ways I do it is to get away from that sketchy thin line drawing with the pencil point and you get into a thicker line where you can get some texture um, off your graphite. One thing you'll notice too is that um, I'm going to go back now and work on where a light source is on this. I'm not going to put the sun in the middle because that would look like a, an old um, church funded painting. You know, the church funded a lot of those classic paintings uh, throughout history. So I'm going to put the sun over to one side and lay in just the lightest touch of uh, texturing off the side of the pencil just to indicate that there is a some color up there. Um, the more you, this is one of those things where you would start uh, very light and then add as you go. You'll get braver and braver with it and get darker and darker as you work on the drawing. Um, and the way to show the sun in this kind of uh, setting is to have everything around it be darker. So I'm not really using a hard line to, to mark the sun. I'm using darkness around it. Okay, see how the fading is on the edge of the line from away from the point of the pencil? That's going to help you uh, define a light source. So for all the trees on the left, I'm going to work in that direction. For the trees on the right, I'll flip the paper and the fade goes back towards the sun again. And that way it, you can tell where the light source is. Cool, huh? I'm just, and now I'm doing the exact opposite of what I told you. <laughs> no, it's the tree on the other side. Okay. Uh, I thought I just caught myself. But look at how you're getting textures off those tree limbs now. As opposed to just using the end of your pencil, you're starting to get some sort of graphite texture, and it looks like the tree, um, you know, actually has something going on to it, some volume, which is what you want. It's much better. And it may seem like a, you know, a cheap trick, like, hey, take the edge of your palette knife and make a Bob Ross painting. But um, the edge of your pencil is part of your tool. Um, it's just as useful as the point of the pencil. Again, uh, very slowly building up the contrast that would be back there. I will come back to it later. Now we're talking about how do you get the sunlight, even in the morning, to dance across the water. As Neil Young said in that song, here comes Cortez dancing across the water. He came dancing across the water. Uh, that sun is dancing across the movement of the water and the water, even though it looks perfectly still, it's usually there's some sort of movement in, in these big lakes or especially if they're river fed. Um, so, there's a balance between do you want it perfectly still um, or do you want to show that there's some life in it. So at this point, we really haven't committed to one or the other. I can do it either way right now. Either way, that sun would still uh, dance across the water top like that. And when you get to the person, of course, you will get the same thing. Um, either a perfect reflection if you're in completely still water which would be weird. Uh, it's possible, but it's not that, not that often. I haven't seen it very often. There's usually some sort of movement in there, especially if there's a wildlife. If you have uh, fish or uh, water snakes. Let's pretend this particular lake is chock full of water moccasins. So they're stirring up the uh, surface pretty well there. Alligators, crocodiles, um, I'm pretty sure there's a shark in there too. 
We're not afraid, are we? So I'm building up slowly um, what I think would be the uh, contrast that's required. And then I'm going to go back into the body of water itself and um, start building that up. One of the ways to get Rachel to be in the front, um, layered in front of all this, is to make sure that she stays lighter than the background. That's why I was concerned about erasing what I can on her. The background will be uh, have textures and shading and grays, and Rachel will end up looking white so that she pops, right? Um, let's see where we are. Yeah, and that's what I'm working on there. I think um, I can do some erasing on that sun and get it to pop a little more. And then I'm going to go ahead and put in water flow. And sticking with the side of the pencil, um, because of the fading that you get on one side, a softer, broader line. And now I am making a blurring the edges, which would actually be the case in the morning when the fog is lifting and things like that. There is a blurring of the delineation in the background. So here is where you would get out your paper stump. I don't have it. Um, so I'm just going to use my fingers. Um, I'm imitating a paper stump there. <laughs> uh, so I just rub my fingers on it and it just kind of softens the edges on everything and now take the white put the white back into the sun and it pops pretty nice um, we're starting to get a little bit moody I think that I would make the sky a little darker now um, and just get braver with that and get a little more contrast going um, but that's kind of it. I mean, what I'm looking for out of a drawing like this is like that, just a sense of place. You look at that and you think, oh, I'm in trees in the snow. You look at this and you think, I'm on a still lake. And that's all you really want out of a drawing like this is just a sense of place. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that you it'll encourage you to draw something that you don't normally draw and try to find a good sense of place, a good sanctuary for yourself and um, in the middle of all this bad news. Uh, art is a very good therapy session. So remember that. See you next week.